Hi, everyone. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy news journalist for over 20 years. This is our News Bites segment where we gather up a bunch of the breaking news and explain it to you. Now, this is just a smaller version of the weekly email newsletter that I send out every week on Fridays. But we understand you're too busy to read. Sometimes you just like to have the news videoed at you. So enjoy the news. James Webb took a direct hit, but it's okay. We got the news this week that JWST was hit by a surprisingly large micrometeoroid. Now, these are small particles of dust really left over from the formation of the solar system or created through collisions between asteroids. They're everywhere across the solar system, and they're tiny, and you can see them during meteor showers things like that. And they impact spacecraft all the time. And they're all designed to handle this. But engineers working with James Webb announced this week that the telescope had been hit by a surprisingly large one. Now, uh, the impact happened sometime between May 23rd and the 25th. And they believe the particle was about 0.1 millimeter, which sounds small, tenth of a millimeter across and yet that's fairly big for micro meteorite impacts. And it caused a noticeable damage to one of the 18 mirror segments C three specifically. And this sounds kind of scary, but it's fine. Uh, NASA has said that even though it did suffer this impact, and it is it did noticeably degrade the quality of images coming from that segment of the mirror it's fine. It's still the entire telescope is still working above and beyond their original expectations. And this is one of the advantages of having these separate mirror segments on web, you can keep the damage down to one of its 18 mirrors and have the rest of them working fine, you're not going to get a spread a larger cracks forming inside the telescope. So these things happen, everything's fine we'll still see those first images from Webb on July 12th. Hubble finds a bunch of galaxies that Webb should really take a look at. The Hubble Space Telescope has been the greatest telescope that humanity has ever launched and over 30 years has been scanning the sky at various wavelengths from near infrared to visible to ultraviolet producing some incredible images making tons of discoveries. And some of the work that it's been doing are these things called surveys. And you're familiar with one probably the 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 Hubble deep field where it stared for a very long time at, at a seemingly empty chunk of the sky and revealed that it was filled with galaxies. Well, they did another survey called cosmos, where they looked at an image a part of the sky that was about two degrees across. And so the full moon is about half a degree. So you can sort of imagine how big that is. And inside this region, it turned up about 2 million galaxies. And many of these galaxies are relatively close to us, but a lot of them are very far away. They're very highly redshifted. Really, we're seeing them as they were just a few 100 million billion years after the Big Bang. It's those extreme galaxies that are really beyond the reach of Hubble to be able to reveal in any detail. But thanks to Webb coming online soon, these are the kinds of targets that will be perfect for Webb to be able to do follow on observations. And so it's really starting to seem like Hubble is now turning into the finder scope for James Webb, which is kind of cool. So Hubble is finding a bunch of, of objects that are just beyond its reach. And they're going to be passing those targets over to James Webb to do follow on observations, all the visible planets in the right order. If you're willing to get up early in the morning before the sun gets up for June, go outside and look up and you will be able to see all of the visible planets in the early morning sky, you'll be able to see Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. And what's cool is that they are all in line, they're all in the right position as you would learn them in the solar system. So you can look at Mercury just above the horizon, then comes Venus, then I guess look at your feet to see Earth, and then look back to the sky, and you'll see Mars and then Jupiter and then Saturn, and they're all nicely lined up. 
And this is fairly rare. It happens, say, once every decade or so, uh, depending on, on how Mercury and Venus and, and Mars sort of align themselves compared to the other planets in the sky. But still, it's a great chance to go out and just see an entire tour of the solar system just with your own eyes. NASA is investigating UFOs. Yeah, I know it sounds kind of crazy to say these words, but NASA has announced this week that they are going to be investigating UFOs or UAPs. And this announcement was made, they're, they're going to essentially be doing their own investigation in the fall to line up with the work that the Pentagon is doing to find these unexplained aerial phenomena. And they're bringing in experts from different fields of optics and flight capability and astronomy, etc. to to look at the data that's been gathered so far, and try to make any conclusions about what it is that they're seeing, they figure the research is going to take about nine months. And they're, in, you know, not they're not going to invest more than about $100,000 into it. So it's not going to take away from uh, any other research that that NASA is doing. And I think what what NASA is most interested in is the chance to discover new natural phenomena that maybe we weren't familiar with. I mean, if you've got all of these military aircraft that are gathering data, you've got various other observations, it's actually a lot of information of, of camera material and testimony and all this that can be looked through. And maybe there are new kinds of auroras, maybe there's going to be new kinds of transient phenomena in the sky. And who knows, right? Maybe uh, there's some astrobiology aspect to this, although you know, I'm, you know, I'm not placing my bets. Um, but like NASA actually invests quite a lot of money into astrobiology, searching for techno signatures, searching for any kind of evidence of intelligent civilizations out there. So it does make sense for NASA to look close to home as well and participate in trying to understand, or at least categorize what these UAPs might be. Now you're watching the news, but maybe you want to talk about the news with me and other fans of space and astronomy. So you should join our discord server. Now we have lots of cool categories where you can talk about the news behind the scenes. I'm in there other people on the team are available to talk. And every week we do a special discussion club where we pick one topic in space and astronomy, and we discuss it live. I'm in there dozen other people. And so if you want a chance to chat with me and the rest of uh, and the rest of the, the people in the discord server, this is a great place to do that. And we'll have a link to where the next event is. And the upcoming event that we're going to do is just like what got you into space and astronomy? What was the moment? What was the event that inspired you to get excited about this topic as a hobby? as a field of research, etc. I'd love to hear and have this chat with you. So come join the discord server, participate in the conversation live. We'll see you this week. Europe is going to be hunting a comet. We got the news this week that the European Space Agency has given the green light to develop their comet interceptor mission. This is a spacecraft that's going to go and fly out to the L2 Lagrange point. So the same place where Webb and Gaia and other missions are going, and it's going to loiter and just wait. And then when an interesting comet candidate is discovered, maybe like a long period comet that's coming in from the outer solar system, or maybe ideally, uh, an interstellar object like we saw with Oumuamua or Borisov, it's going to fire up its engines and begin an intercept trajectory to try and do a flyby of this object and take some images up close, scan, get information about its surface characteristics, etc. And then fly past off into space. It's going to be launching in 2029 as part of the aerial mission. So it's just going to be a stowaway on board as the aerial flies out to L2. And so this week, the European Space Agency gave it the green light to begin the development. They've been in the study phase up to this point, And now they're actually going to be building the spacecraft in time to launch by 2029. The Mars rovers have been busy. We got a really cool picture that came from Curiosity Rover this week, and you're gonna have to look at it and see it. I it looks like a bird is stuck underground with its legs sticking up behind it. There are these weird rocky spikes that are jagging out of the ground. 
And you're probably wondering, like, what are they? And geologists aren't entirely sure, but they have a few theories. One idea is that what you're looking at is there was a crack in some rock, like maybe some kind of sandstone, and it was filled with some other material. And then the other material around it weathered and all that's left is the material that filled those cracks. Another idea, and this is kind of more exciting, is that they could be fulgurites. And those are where lightning strikes happen here on Earth, you can find them there's like this weird, sort of jagged rock that forms the shape of where the lightning strike went into the Earth a little bit. And you can kind of clear away the dirt and you get this, these really strange formations. Now this would be very surprising because there hasn't been a lot of lightning activity seen on Mars. But one possibility is that during some of the big dust storms on Mars, we know there's a lot of electrostatic charge that builds up. And it might be that there are lightning strikes happening that are generating these fulgurites on Mars. And this is an evidence of them. So it's a mystery. We don't exactly know what it is how it formed. But maybe if we find more, we'll be able to get a sense of what these things are. And over on the other side of the planet, perseverance is really starting to discover that it is in one of the windiest most dust deviliest parts of Mars. And scientists knew that when they sent Perseverance to Jezero crater on Mars, that it was a fairly windy, very active place, but they, I think didn't realize just how busy it is. Now that Perseverance has been going for over a year, they've discovered multiple examples of dust devils going past the rover, they think it gets sideswiped by about four a day. And you can see in this short video clip, there's like six dust devils on the screen at the same time across the landscape. So it's a very dust devil -y part of Mars. And the dust devils could be responsible for the fine dust that is held suspended in the atmosphere around Mars, they could be kicking it up and it just remains in the air. And so it's interesting to track a place where this many dust devils are happening. And one last thing for perseverance is that a picture shows that it's got a rock in one of its wheels. And it turns out it's been bringing this rock along for about 100 days. Now it doesn't cause any problem to the rover. And at some point, the rock will inevitably fall back out. But it's kind of surprising that it's held on to it for 100 days. And I sort of I like to think of it like you when you go out on some hike with a friend and they just can't help themselves but grab a rock and then bring that carry it with them for the rest of the hike and bring it home. NASA has bought more crew dragons. This week, we got the announcement that NASA has purchased another five crew dragon flights from SpaceX, which will allow it to fly up until 2030 when the expectation is they're going to be dropping the space station into the atmosphere, burning it up and dumping it into the spacecraft graveyard in the Pacific Ocean. And this is good. This is a commitment showing that NASA is serious about going all the way till 2030. And then you can layer on top of that NASA's commitment to pay for flights with the Starliner, which we talked about has docked and now roughly demonstrated its ability to perform its mission. And so the next thing is it will actually be carrying astronauts to the space station. And so at this point, NASA will have sort of queued up all of the human space flights that are going up to the space station. Of course, where this all gets complicated is that the Russians have announced that they're probably going to be ending their commitment to the space station by 2024. And since the Russian module is the one that provides the station upkeep that the Russian progress spacecraft are the ones that actually help boost the station to maintain its orbit. It's going to get a little complicated, a little weird. NASA is going to have to potentially figure out new ways to be able to keep the space station aloft to fulfill that 2030. Or the Russians can come back to the negotiating table and continue their commitment all the way to 2028 or 2030 to give them time. So we know it's going to be more Crew Dragon flights, but the long term future of the International Space Station is still kind of uncertain. Mitsubishi is making 3D printed antenna for satellites. So here's a topic that I'm quite excited about the idea of 3d printing space hardware while you're in space. And we've done a ton of stories on universe today about this as well as I've done lots of interviews with people associated with this kind of thing. And so in this case, uh, Mitsubishi has announced that they're going to try to 
build a antenna while they're in space. 3d printed essentially. Now they've done an experiment already here on Earth, they've been able to print a 16.5 centimeter antenna in a test chamber, but now they're going to try and fly something to space. And the idea is really cool that you go to space with the raw material. And then when you're in microgravity, you're able to then fashion and construct trusses and support structures and in this case an antenna where you don't have to have it be able to handle earth gravity be able to handle the the problems of space flight that you only build this thing while you're in space and you can imagine some far far future where entire telescopes space stations etc are all manufactured in space so this is a great test example of this and you can compare this to an interview that i did with dr edward Balaban about building a liquid mirror in space, and then using say the light from the sun to harden your mirror into shape, so that you can actually have a functioning telescope. So this is a really exciting field. And I know we're gonna have a lot more research, and a lot more interesting projects and prototypes and missions coming up. So stay tuned. We've done a bunch of really cool interviews on the channel in the last couple of days. One is with Dr. Zach Putnam, we talked about using pulsars as a navigation system. Imagine if a spacecraft gets cut off from Earth and is drifting and is out of course, how can it find out where it is so that it can say, finish off some descent burn into Mars without being able to communicate with Earth? It's a complicated problem. And Dr. Putnam thinks he has the answer. And I did an interview with Dr. Jacob Hawk Misra about searching for techno signatures. What ways can we search for signals from intelligent civilizations across the Milky Way? Now, this is just a subset of all of the news that we covered on Universe Today this week. So we've got links to all of the stories. But again, if you really want to get all the news, you want to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. This is where I write a magazine of space news with links, pictures, lots of information. And there's no ads. I write every word of the newsletter. So if you're into that, go to universetoday.com slash newsletter. And if you just want a podcast edition, you can also sign up for that go to universe today.com slash podcast or search for universe today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the work that we do on universe today, you should consider joining our Patreon. This gives you behind the scenes information, ad free information on universe today. If you join our Patreon, I'll remove all the ads from universe today for life. So you definitely do that go to patreon.com slash universe today. Thanks to everyone who already supports us on Patreon and a special thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, the galaxy wanderers, your support means the universe to us. Alright, those were all the stories this week. We'll see you next week.